Good afternoon, and welcome to the Voice of Wisdom. With over 60 years of experience as an investment banker, entrepreneur, investment analyst, economist, and venture capitalist, Morty Davis is Wall Street and capitalism personified. The over 400 companies for which he has raised more than $3 billion over the years have created a countless number of jobs and exciting new products. Through the voice of wisdom, Mr. Davis explores, analyzes, and debates the most topical political, economic, and social issues facing our world today. Joining Mr. Davis today is Esty Stoller for a continuing discussion on Mr. Davis's exciting life. Please join the conversation by calling 332-263-3300. That's 332-263-3300. And now, Mr. Davis and Ms. Stoller. Welcome back. I'm delighted to be back with you again Wednesday at 6.30 every day. And uh, as you as, uh, were just told, you're listening to Morty Davis, The Voice of Wisdom. And tonight I have with me uh, my daughter, my brilliant daughter, who happens to be a lawyer. I'll forgive her for that. <laughs> but she's the real voice of wisdom. So she, she knows everything I know, plus what she managed to pick up during her lifetime at that undergraduate school, that graduate school, that at law school. So she's going to either cross-examine me or, or criticize me or do whatever she likes. And you can join in with her if you have any issues or or you want some knowledge that I can convey to you, I'm happy to do anything you all want, because that's, that's what I strive to do every week. So let me begin by saying I'd like to um, teach you a lot of what I wrote in my book, Hard Knocks to Hot Stocks. This is the book. Uh, Larry King said... Well, let me tell them what Larry King said, because first of all, the voice of wisdom and the real voice of wisdom was who did? The re- my wife was the real voice of wisdom, but she passed away. Right. So I try to fill in for her, or Esty is going to try to fill in for her, but we really can't. She was too great and too terrific. Some Some people are irreplaceable. But anyway... So the book is From Hard Knocks to Hot Stocks. I'd love to hear what the hard knocks were and what the hot stocks are, because I know you're current. Of course, everybody wrote great things, Larry King and Donald Trump and Senator Doyle and Alan Greenberg, but I think they're going to hear for themselves how great you are. So even, whoa, even Carl Icahn, even Rosie Davis, your wife, that's the best <laughs> endorsement of all. And most people who met you, I know you've met King. Why, said, don't, why don't you read what uh, Larry King said and uh, and what? Donald Trump said, at least. Are you ready for this, guys? This is, the, this is from Larry King. And I quote, This is the best book I've ever read on making it big. You're in the hands of a master. Enjoy. And this is from Donald J. Trump before he was the president. He was smart. That's, this thing he was definitely right about. I don't care who you voted for. And I quote, <clears throat> Morty Davis has written... A Chronicle of Great Triumph. It is full of intriguing speculation and clear insights, provocative, challenging, and enlightening, and written by a unique man who really knows the score. A must read. And that's the smartest thing he ever said. Okay, during this uh, session today, I hope to uh, give you some of the leads, some of the advice, some of the guidance of how to make it big in this world. So you don't just mean the stock market, do you? No. What do you mean? Career-wise, uh, how you pick your your career, uh, what what ingredients or recipes make for for a, a success, and I'll give you all of that. But right now we have a caller, one of the most stimulating callers we ever get. And that's Brett Kingstone, somebody I took public years ago. He was just starting out. He had uh, really no money, just an idea. 
and he's done a fabulous, fabulous job. He's built a great company. So, Brett, welcome back. Thank you. <clears throat> when you said you bring them public, what do you mean by that? Brett, Brett does that uh, cover it, or, uh, or you want to say something <laughs> more? Uh, are you all right? Hello. Hello. Brett, are you all right? Hey, okay, morning. Yes. I, hey, Morty, I, I was listening to Essie read all those great quotes about your book, <laughs> yeah. Donald Trump and Larry King. Quite impressive, I'm telling you, right. Morty. Thank what you. What a life you've had. Thank you. I had people like you in my life that made me look like a hero. Because when I bet on a guy like you, I would look like a genius. Some of the other guys I bet on make, make me look like the biggest idiot. So I, thankfully, I got guys like you that I backed and supported and did, uh, when I say I backed them, I did initial public offerings for them. I helped them get financing for, for and I, I helped you launch took them. Public, Morty. Pardon me? You took us public and then we sold our stock to Cooper Industries on New York Stock Exchange. You uh, made it happen, Morty. Uh, you really did. You made it you happen. created hundreds I've, of thousands, if not millions of jobs. You, you launched the careers of hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs. You've created a tremendous amount of wealth uh, uh, for our citizens. And more importantly, you inspired people to go out there and make it happen. And you, you're living proof of that. Well, and I thought he was just my dad. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> He's the best. He and really is. He, you are like the rock at your brawls in the family. I enjoyed hearing you read those quotes. And it's just great to see the admiration. You know, more to your true wealth is the love of all your children. I mean, it's amazing how the relationship that you've maintained over the years and how much love and support you have. And, you know, Esty, you've always had a big heart. I remember seeing you when I was at the office. My God, I was in my 20s. So <laughs> I, I was two years old. Years <laughs> <laughs> Look, my wife and I, Beth, my wife and I took Hillary Clinton seriously because she said it takes a village. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a village. All my four daughters, my thirty grandchildren, my sixty great grandchildren, my God, and uh, and my two my great God. great grandchildren all live within a, 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 a about uh, two blocks, except if they uh, moved to some of them. A few of them moved to Israel because they left Israel. And the fathers, anybody uh, went as as far as I remember is uh, a few of them moved to New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little closer. Right. But I'll tell you, Morty, you've done billions of dollars of underwriting and deals on the stock exchange, but your greatest wealth is what you've just said. Your children, your grandchildren, that's your, your greatest wealth. And the relationship, again, unbelievable. I can only hope you know, that with my three children, when they have grandchildren, I can have the same relationship and it's you know it's just part of the same uh the same pattern of how you inspire entrepreneurs and win their trust and win their friendship i mean you took us public morty gosh 30 years ago i mean 35 years ago something like that i, I didn't know you and, were that uh, old you know, still <laughs> i think of you all the time brad i didn't know you were that old i thought you were since about 30. are you more than 30. <laughs> I'm 62, Morty, wow. but I still climb mountains and I still jump out of airplanes wow. and still ride motorcycles across the country. But yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll do it I all with your children. Myself, you'll do it all with your children because you have good values and you're a hardworking guy and you're just great. That's yeah, I mean, fantastic. Now I've retired to my ranch in Colorado. We got 35 acres. I'm looking out the window. I see the entire front range of the Rocky Mountains from the Flatirons. To the Continental Divide, it's beautiful, and my neighbors are bear, elk, and and uh, mountain lion, so it's, it's nice, very quiet. You probably have a lot less trouble with your neighbors than some of the people around here have with this, so maybe that's a good alternative. I love what you said about my father yeah, and the relationship that we have, because really, I think, what did you always yeah. write in your book? First of all, his dedication was, in his books, to my wife, my life. But also your best blue chips. What did yeah. you always say about your best blue chips? Or your best blue chips? My kids, my grandkids, 
my great grandkids. Absolutely. I love them all. You know, I Absolutely. would. I always said I'd give all my money, everything I have, if I could come up with a care, cures, because I funded a lot of uh, health care companies, overwhelmingly, by far, mm-hmm. uh, medical, health care, biotech. And I said I'd yep. give every penny I have if I could cure cancer or heart disease, because I care more about that than making money. So my kids and, they, and their kids and, and, and they, forever, the generations to come forever, will not suffer these her, 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 horrendous diseases. So, and I still feel that way. Yeah. Um, and that's why you gave us those good values that family comes first and working hard and caring about your family. Yeah. And that's, that's really the key. And it's not the materialism, it's the inspiration and all the love that you gave us and the positivity. So can we get some of the secrets? Brett Kingstone became a success thanks to you and your intuitive ability and your no, raising thanks, him thanks, and his brilliance, of thanks course. Thanks to Brett's ability. I know. And I'm glad, I'm glad I sh- was able to share in somewhat in, in his success. So, Brett, can I ask Marty, Mr. Davis, my father, yeah, to right share it. how he became a success or yeah. what, what, what he noticed about someone like you and how he brought the companies? Because people are... People want to be the next, the next Brett Kingstone or, or reach some modicum of success in their life, in their family life, and in their business. So what do you say? First of all, what's it, why do you say I choose the jockey? Well, yeah, he's a great jockey. I always, well, he's always told me it's about the jockey. Yeah. yeah. So horse what does it mean? It's not about the horse, it's the jockey. No, yeah. so, so Brett, Brett epitomizes the people I back and, <laughs> and, and fund. He's driven... He's motivated and he's dedicated. He dedicates himself totally to what he what he's and doing. Sugar. And, and sugar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, that's what I look. That's why. That, that's exactly what I look for. I, I, I don't. I don't use the word mashuga. I, I like to say compulsively driven. You know, so they 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 won't give up. That no matter what happens. They make it happen. So is that the advice you give everyone out there? What's your advice to people listening? Is that what you always, want to tell them? Always. And I would say to every mother and everybody's thoughts of family, the best thing you can do is inspire your kids with confidence and with a belief in themselves. I remember, um, Amen. I remember learning about Albert Einstein. He was going to school in, um, in Germany where he was born. And one day the teacher asked him to take a, a, a letter back to his mother and not not to open the letter, the envelope, but to give it to her without opening it. So he, he followed her instructions and he gave it to his mother. And then he said, what did the teacher say? You know, so she said, oh, you're going to... Brad, excuse me. I think there's some beautiful background noise. It sounds like someone's trying to pre- yes, rehearse. Yes, my baby. It's my, uh, my, my 18-month-old daughter, Lily. Oh, so mazel she tov. She Morty's voice. All right. And, and she's very excited. She's very excited to hear Morty when he talks. So she, Every time Morty talks, she kind of screams with joy. It's well, I think he stimulated and inspired a lot of people. But if you just, I think, just let her keep it. Let's hear. So, Dad, what's her what, what's her name? What's her name? Her name's Lily. Lily. Oh, Lily I love that name. Lily, it's great to you. <laughs> great having you on my program. Thank you. Hear you. That, Lily? you. You started. Morty, Morty's <laughs> telling you, if you if you work hard and you make things happen, you'll go on his program in a few years. <laughs> Never mind. Yeah, I think about that Lily is smiling. She's on now. She's on now. And she's our youngest, our youngest participant. We love it. That is great. Now we can really say we have from 18 yeah. months to over 90 involved in this program. That's a wide range. So you were Un- saying? Unbelievable. You were saying? I was saying? That Einstein, you told us the story how yeah, smart yeah. his mother was. Yeah. No, and you so, told it to us. It's worth repeating, but I think. No, I, I could re- can't repeat it often enough because it's so brilliant. Right. That's and right. every mother should learn to do this. Give your kids confidence. So she read the letter to to uh, to Albert Einstein, to her son. And she said, your teacher says you're brilliant and smart and you're going to go far in life. You're going to reach the very top. And he was so thrilled and so uplifted. So he behaved in accordance with that message. And years later, after she passed away, he found that letter 
and he read it, and he <laughs> couldn't believe what it said. It said, "Your son, yeah, you should take your son, uh, um, Albert, your son Albert, out of, out of the class and send him to a special school because he's not equipped to handle the." The material and and he's never going to go any place if you keep him in a regular school, and he couldn't believe that his mother <laughs> read it to him to, to inspire him. And if she read him that, he probably would have been a, a total failure, because it was so devastating. So inspire your kids, lift them up, reassure them, even if they make a mistake, if they do poorly sometime, just just encourage them. Encouragement is is the best way to bring up kids. And also, <clears throat> the next thing you should do, anybody that goes to work or start a, starts an entrepreneurial uh, business, is set, a, set up a goal and, and write it down. And then keep looking at it as you're moving along in your career. Keep your eye on the, on the, on the ball. Keep on... Looking back and see what you see what you said, because <clears throat> the only the biggest mistakes I so made. Morty, Morty, and Esty, I have a question for you both. Yes, and I want both of you to answer this because Esty, because I respect your opinion, Esty, very much. You're very insightful. You always have been, Morty and Esty. I really believe this current woke generation is lost. They have no ambition. They want everything for free. I paid off my student loans. I worked two jobs when I was at Stanford University. I worked on construction. I hauled away concrete with a wheelbarrow after the jackhammers got it and put it in a dumpster. I did that for four years to help pay off my student loans. And they just want everything for free. They would want their student loans forgiven. They don't want to work. They don't want to pay back. Um, you wouldn't believe the huge percentage of people who stayed home when they were getting checks from the government rather than go work. Um, uh, it, it turned into almost now the kids don't even want to go back to work. They want to sit, sit you know, in their underpants watching uh, their uh, video games and then maybe do a few hours of work in between. I've never seen a un more unmotivated generation in history. It's not like the great generation of my father who fought World War II no. and my stepfather, who's a B-17 bomber pilot, no. worked with the GI Bill, got his education and built up a big company. What's your advice? How do you reawaken these woke generation who seem to have no ambition, no goals? The only thing they want to do is maybe go out and protest and demand to get a whole bunch of things for free rather than work hard for it. Well, How do you re-inspire these well, people? Brett, How do you wake the, the, the woke? Brett, I have to tell, have to tell you and my precious listeners that you're a perfect role model. So people should look at the people that succeed and talk to them and get advice to them from them and, and follow their lead. Brett, yeah. Brett, I think you asked a fantastic question. We want to answer it. Yes. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the best way to answer it is to use, to listen, to hear about my father's life. Because I think you and him, you exemplify, and your father exemplify exactly what's necessary and can be inspiring. So I want to hear a little bit about your life, and that way you can tell us how you did, because you faced the same things. You started out very, very poor. I mean, I know you told mommy yeah. or my your wife that you yeah. wish she didn't have a pair of shoes yeah. because of that. So my, I think yeah. right now we're going to turn our attention on how your life went and how your life can be an example and people like Brett and, and that previous generation to all of us because I think all of us are very much anticipating to see how we could go basically from hard knocks to hot stocks. I have to tell you, even though my father didn't... Well, well I remember this... You should go ahead, Morty, go ahead. I said, even though my father didn't... Go ahead, didn't uh, instill a lot of confidence in me, was always very critical of me. But I was a, a, a product of the times, or at least I, I digested the times. I and, and took in the, the, the times because I was born in 1929. I don't know if you remember that. That was the year of the crash and the beginning of the Great Depression. Yep. And I was always wor working to distance myself from that kind of poverty, 
So I, I had an, a special motivation. Even when I became very rich, I still you know, hesitated to take a taxi. I'd, I'd start walking, and then I'd said, oh, I already walked 14 blocks, so I won't spend the money on a taxation a taxi, even though I spend a lot of money mm-hmm. entertaining people. I, I, I always pick up the tab when I take uh, my my uh, prospects to, to lunch or dinner, uh, my, my clients. So it's not uh, being cheap. It's just valuing all the things that you can bring into your life that's positive if you, if you work hard. The secret of working hard is if you work hard and don't give up, you 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 gotta win. You you just gotta win because uh, that's what it takes. If you don't stop, you know it may take a long time. I mean, you know, it's like one guy said, I became an overnight success after I worked my butt off for forty years. Nobody, nobody, nobody. Yeah. Make, nobody Can I ask you a question? Not um, yeah. you're saying you worked, but I think people just assume. Just assume that it, these things just happen. Can you give us some of this background? What happened? I know you were once a ju- you worked in jewelry. Like people think it went from A to Z. Some of the interesting stops along your career, or I should say, along your life journey, how you achieved some of the jobs you had, some of the failures you faced, or some of the successes that you had, or some of the obstacles you overcame because that's what I really want to hear about even though I might know some of the stories it's always good Mm. that I can learn more from them well I'll tell you one thing as I became a success who's who called me and had an interview and I had an interview with who's who yeah and at that time it was a big deal to get into who's who and they asked me for a quote Mm. my what's my favorite quote yeah I said my favorite quote is the harder you work the luckier you get you need luck because you need at least this much luck to stay healthy because I had friends that were brighter than me, that were also very talented, more talented than me. But they just didn't have the motivation to get to get to where, where I got to the very top. So motivation is one of the things. But to, I just want to hear personally some of those stories, like because people can't really believe they like. Did you ever work in a jewelry place? Did you ever work in umbrellas? What were some of the things well, before? That's one of the things that drove me throughout my life. What was? Because all the jobs I ever had early on, I started to work at 14 wow. delivering bottles of milk. Uh, to, uh, to At that time, they made deliveries of bottles of milk to uh, their customers. And I, I was delivering milk 5 o'clock in the morning with a wagon. I had to take a searchlight to see the addresses because at five o'clock in the morning in the winter, it was very dark and I, I, uh, my teeth were chattering. And, and unfortunately for me, a lot of those bottles busted <laughs> from the freezing weather. Wow. And I had to pay the uh, grocery owner back at the end of the week. So I was lucky if I netted, <laughs> netted any <laughs> income because I... I I wasn't paid that much in, to start with. And then when he took off what I owed him for the the bo- bottles of milk that got blown up and uh, I couldn't, he couldn't sell. So I was strongly motivated to get a better job. All I ever wanted after that was a job in a warm place with a desk. That's all I ever wanted. But did you ever work in a fruit store? I worked in a fruit store, fruit and vegetable store, Served me well because I was once waiting for a, a job during the summer uh, in the in the Catskills yeah. at the hotels. I worked every summer at these hotels from the time I was fifteen, and <clears throat> and somebody walked into the employment agency where there were a hundred guys waiting for jobs, and it was Friday afternoon. I thought I w- wouldn't get a job for the weekend; I'd be un- unemployed and lose out totally. So this man walks in and he says, he says, does anybody have a, a fruit and vegetable experience? Wait, I'm just taking the glasses off because you don't need fruit, them. <laughs> fruit, and ve- fruit and vegetable experience. I raised my hand. Yes, I do. He said, well, where did you work? I said, I worked in a fruit market. I 
I was cleaning the potatoes, the dust off the potatoes. I was taking the, the leaves off the lettuce. And I, and I filled in for, for others when they got busy and I helped weigh the stuff before they paid at the cash register. So he said, okay, you're hired. So he had a place, a fruit and market, a fruit and vegetable place at the edge of Monticello. That was a big summer destination. And um, he walked me back there. It was about 10 blocks from the agency. And I asked him, I said, what are the hours? And he says to me, you're fired. I said, what do you mean you're fired? I just was asking you what the hours. He says, there's no hours. We we open uh, July 4th on Memorial Day. We close Labor Day. And, you know, you sleep upstairs on, on the sacks of uh, vegetables, on, on the sacks of potatoes and so forth. <laughs> but he, he really said I was fired. And I, I, I said, yeah, okay, it's okay with me. I'll do whatever you say. He says, no, you're fired. <laughs> so that was a good lesson. What was the lesson? I never, I never ask anymore, what are the hours? I <laughs> just say, Give it, let me have the job. So what about you? How long do you work? And what do you think about using? No, and then I had every kind of job. I had a but job. Do you, but does it mean that people should work long hours, short hours? People are always saying, what's the job? You're right, how many hours? But I guess total dedication means that you're full first, time. First of all, every young person should try a lot of different uh, career possibilities because you should waste your life in that sense, learning what to see what you what you'd be successful at, and most importantly, what you love, because if you love what you do, Mark Twain said, "If you love what you do, you never work a day in your life." And also, you're much more likely to get success, achieve success. I had a friend that was working for his father-in-law, very wealthy father-in-law, and all his daughters, I think four daughters also. He hired their their, their husbands. So, and he was the one that was handing out the money, and the girls were so proud. But this guy had ambitions, and he resented that he had a, he did, couldn't express his own vent, adventure in business. It, to the to, he came to see me because he wanted me to be buy a, a, a big grocery chain, and he, he was suffering from ulcers because every morning, like a lot of people that are unhappy with their jobs, he come in at nine o'clock and he'd start looking at the clock and he couldn't wait till it was five o'clock. And that's a horrible thing to do. When I started to work on a job I loved, I couldn't wait to, to get in in the morning again. And I stayed as long, as late in the night as I, I could to try to be successful. The only time I stopped calling was when somebody said, you have a hell of a lot of nerve calling at this hour. So I figured it. <laughs> I wasn't going to make a, <laughs> make too much, be too successful with people at that hour. Well, so. twelve in the night. Yeah. But what about? Did you ever take time off? When was your time off? Was it the weekends? Was it what? What did that do for you? The weekends, Shabbos, Saturday. Yeah. Was that a no? When when I was young, I I resented the the Jewish religion because it was it had made made so many demands that I thought were unfair or used up your time, because I went to school, to this Hebrew school, yeshiva it's called, from nine, from nine to seven, six days a week, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday I got out at three o'clock, or two o'clock, because I had to get ready for the Sabbath. And Saturday, you prohibited, at least at that time, I felt you prohibited from doing anything, you know, you can't get into a car, you can't, uh, uh, play sports, you, you know, you, you're supposed to rest and spend time with your family. And now I find it to be the greatest gift over the years. I changed. I find it to be the greatest gift that God gave any people because all I do is spend time with my kids and all those that I love. And we, we spend time together Friday night eating a big meal and sat at lunch eating a big meal together. All the little kids get a chance to, we ask them, what did you learn this week? And they get a chance to speak and talk up. It builds their confidence. And, you know, you only do fun things. You, you don't drive, so you walk. You walk to the synagogue, 
and then you know whether whether you're totally immersed in in, in religion or in, in your dedication to God, it's still people come at, at different levels. They come either that they're totally involved with the deity, with the, with the, with being involved with God, and they're praying very hard. Or they're coming to to talk to their buddies and in, in, in the synagogue, and and the time they bang the the uh, what's the R on the, the table? The stand, the stand, the podium. Yeah, they bang the podium quiet, so you know, so we can continue our prayers in, in reasonable quiet. And then there's a third group that just shows up, and from the time they show up, they they pray a little. And then they go in the back and and make kiddush, which is they they have a shot of whiskey and some sponge cake and and then some chalant or, or some f- food and and they talk to their buddies. They have a good time, so it's a wonderful thing. And we only walk and and talk to each other, and it's all the things that are of value. Right. And and also the one of the nice things that I liked as I got older was it, it said it's a mitzvah okay. it's, a, it's a merit to uh, to do to uh, to increase uh, uh, the Jewish people as my mother would say now is the time when we should change the subject <laughs> so let me ask you what so, are, uh, anyway the, <laughs> you do only fun things <laughs> right I, that, that's a good way of saying it that's great and I know because I was there when my father came home, and it was the, it was a very important family time. But I do remember that even if we called you in the office during the week, no matter how busy you were, you always picked up the phone. And never forget that. Right. Make your kids. Make Nothing us- has a higher priority for me than my loved ones, my kids, particularly my wife. <clears throat> I might be a little upset because I'm in the middle of a, a very promising uh, conversation or a, a, a really important client critical and a critical juncture but if i see my kids call nothing stops me if i lose the deal i lose the deal oh. but anyway i just let me interpret because i said pruvu pruvu means uh, thou shalt be fruitful and and multiply <laughs> yeah. so on saturday even though there's a lot oh, of things right. you can't do you can help uh, be fruitful oh. and multiply Ma, what could I tell you? I tried, but he got us by. <laughs> but anyway, you're fruitful and multiplied. Have four beautiful daughters and great great grandchildren. So hard knocks to hot stocks. Just to go back, how I made a fortune through smart investing and how you can too. So, what was some of the hard knocks, and what is some of the 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 way you can do it? I mean, you keep saying we hear over and over. It's hard work. It's determination. It's long hours. This is no. I had, I had a number of jobs which. All of which I hated. Yeah, I got a job in um, a, a relative of a distant relative of mine was an engraver in the jewelry business, and he hired me. Was going to train me, and I started to do engraving on rings or on bracelets. What about diamonds? Did you do diamonds also? I did diamonds too. Everything. I did everything. So that was another job. So anyway, <laughs> with the diamonds, I was getting being trained by a guy who had the equipment in his apartment. Yeah, uh, the the, um, the wheels that had diamond on it, diamond, I guess segments or pieces, and you put the when you wanted to design the diamond correctly because it's it starts out as a dirty little rock. So you put it down on the on the wheel, and then you put a weight on it, and you wait for a while, and then you look at it again and see how it's doing. If you leave it on too long, you can not only have the diamond disappear, but the tool and everything <laughs> that, that that's in, because it's very powerful. But anyway, uh, one time during that uh, experience, uh, the the uh, union for the diamond industry found out about this place that was not unionized or, you know, in a, per, in a guy's house. And they broke down the door. <laughs> they yeah. came in 
And he, he said, let's jump out the window. We ran down the fire escape and ran away. So it's always been exciting. So what happened to the diamonds? And the, the, Diamond we, dust. We took, it, we took them off the machine. Oh, but, good. Wow. Normally, they beat up the people that were, were breaking the union. So and then with the uh, with the engraving, yeah, I had to put the uh, thing in a vice, right. uh, the ring, yeah, and I I put it in a, in a piece of round wood, like a, a shaped like a, a half a cigar, and on the top a piece of wood. On the top, we put on uh, like a rusty glue, glue kind of, and then. I put it in a fire that was uh, always burning near the where I worked, and uh, it it melted the goo, and then when it melted, I stuck the ring in, and it, li- it immediately, you know, hardened, and then I could engrave the ring. Right. So two things that happened that I hated. One is every time I melted that goo, and be- before I got it into the uh, in- on the piece of wood. Some of that goo leaked on my hand, and I had to, in order to pull the glue off, I had to pull off part of my skin. That was one thing. And then when I started engraving the ring, it was a very sharp tool, and every time I missed and I hit my other hand, I cut my, my hand. So it was a very unhappy job. Then I went from that job to being a, a, a stretcher of... A, of furs. What does that mean, a stretch of furs? Well, before before you, we we made bone martens and stone martens. We made um, uh, fur neck pieces. Now I get it. And and uh, before you you start to shape it and everything, you got to stretch it out so it's appropriate to, to work on, and that it hangs around a woman's neck properly. So in stretching the, the furs, I never realized this, the back of the animal's furs is a, a, a skin yeah. that's very rough. And as you stretch it, your hand starts to get really sore and then it ultimately it bleeds. But the people in the industry, for a while, their hand gets... Um, What's the word? Calloused. Calloused. So let me ask you. So when you say blood, sweat, and tears to reach where you are, you're saying long L- hours. Literally, literally. Literally blood, sweat, and tears. I don't know. Yeah. And then one time my brother, who was ahead of me, he was younger, but he went through, right through school. I dropped out at 14 because I rebelled. Uh, my rabbis beat me up. My father beat me up. I probably deserved it, but uh, <laughs> but it was really an unhappy experience uh, going to that school. And, and uh, in addition, we went to school seven o'clock. There was a public school on the next block that got out at two o'clock, three o'clock, the latest. And then they were playing ball and, and, and having fun. And we never had a chance to do that. We had Hebrew studies in the morning and English studies in the afternoon. We were busy all day studying and studying. So I hated it. And it, together with getting beat up and, and, uh, my father had a temper. He was newly so arrived. So why they beat you up? My father was newly arrived from wow. Hungary, and um, and it was very hard for him to get a job because in those days he had to work Saturdays to get a job, and he wouldn't work Saturdays. So he, he actually got a bought a pushcart and sold fruit and vegetables on the Lower East Side off a pushcart. Uh, Jackie Mason, the comedian, said. Uh, you know, because it was very hard times, the, the Great Depression. So he said his father had a push guard and sold things off the push guard as well. But he said his father was wiped out in a crash because a lot of people jumped out of the window in those days because their stocks were going to zero and their life was going to, to hell. So he said my father was wiped out in a crash because somebody jumped out of the window and landed on, <laughs> landed on his push guard. <laughs> And then finally, yeah. finally, my brother who went to college, uh, my parents didn't know anything about college. They never even finished high school. They came here young. And, and, and uh, my mother was 14 when she came here. They put her in 1A, first grade. 
at 14. Oh my so gosh. She was the tallest kid in the class, obviously. But she dropped that real quickly because she was embarrassed and it was so bad. Ultimately, she went back to night school so she could take the uh, um, citizen's exam to become a citizen. Uh, and you had to do it in those days in English. Now you could do it in about 40 or 140 different languages. But at that time, you had to take the exam in English. So they didn't know anything about how, uh, colleges. My father found out about the best parochial, Hebrew parochial school, the best yeshiva, which is, was in So you're saying that you're, you started out hard life, your parents are immigrants, they went through a lot. Then your brother goes to school. He ends up, I think you said, college and then Harvard and you learned. So tell the people, they're just sitting on the edge of their seats, at least I am. And we're trying to see how we could be that person, how we could succeed. Because bottom line, we told them we're going to give them a few tips. So let me ask you, while, we're not going to fruit while, well, Let me tell you what happened. While my brother was at college, he, he, um, he worked um, like he went, initially at night. So he worked during the day and he got a job as an estate planner for Aetna Life. And he, he was um, he was um, he had a phone on his desk. He had a, a desk. He had a, a pad. He had a pencil. That was the job I envied because he was in a warm place. He had a and also he had a secretary so I asked my brother to set me up for with a with a an appointment to get a job like that with at my life. So he, he set me up with a very handsome tall Irishman, and uh, who invited me to lunch, wow. and in the Wall Street area. And I was so retarded, I came with white with black shoes and white socks, and uh, he took me to a top flight restaurant called White's, and I, he, he handed me the, my men, the menu, yeah. and I didn't know what to order, so I'd never been in a fancy restaurant. So I ordered a, 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 a tuna and tomato on toast, lettuce and tomato on toast, and uh, mayonnaise, and uh, when they brought it, I thought I'd, I'd be fancy, you know, I thought that was necessary. So I started cutting the sandwich with a knife and fork, <laughs> and he was very nice. He said, Look, he said, you could, Morty, you could pick it up. It's okay. So I picked it up. <clears throat> so then we talked about the career and what I'd like to do. So I, I said, you know, I'd like to get the same job as my brother. And my brother had to change his name because he said, I wouldn't hire you with the name Philip DeVitowitz. And if you ever say anything about that, I asked you to, I asked you to change your name. You'll never get a job anywhere in, in the United States. So he changed his name to John Darcy. So, <laughs> so Philip Davidowitz, so Fabian, it was his nickname. So I called him up. I said, his secretary answer. I said, let me speak to John Darcy. <laughs> <laughs> One but, step away from John Darcy. But anyway, at the end of the interview, he said, I won't hire you for, for the same job as your brother. We, we, we don't need any more people in that space. But I'll hire you as a salesman. So I said, why would you hire me as a salesman and not as a, an estate planner? Because I'm at college too now. So he said, well, we have about 5,000 salesmen at Aetna and six out of the top 10 are of your faith, of Jewish faith. So you apparently have some kind of drive or some kind of ability. So, so I'd hire you as a salesman. I didn't want to be a salesman because I'd been a salesman door to door, selling pots and pans, selling vacuum cleaners. It was a horrible job. You lugged stuff around in the winter. I had a car. I, I was my teeth were chattering, and I was dragging these things from house to house, selling it on installment. So they paid me two dollars down and a dollar a week and forever. And and in the summertime. It was so hot, I was dragging around uh, heavy stuff like vacuum cleaners and bed sets, everything, you know. So I didn't want to be a salesman anymore. That was it. So that was 
you know, the sad story of my career. I, but I the had obstacles, every, every, nothing stopped you. You kept going. You kept going. No, that was one thing that changed my life yeah. and my brother's life. Yeah. He was in a class at Brooklyn College, and an economic professor that he had said, announced to, to the class that the average student graduating Harvard Business School 10 years out was making $25,000 a year. This was the height of the Depression. Wow. Nobody made even 5000 You know, it was $25,000. You could buy a square block of houses in my area, in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Did you? you? I wish you would have. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right? Today, what it is today. Today, you pay more for for one condo than you could pay. You had to pay for three blocks in it. But I'm just, just saying, it was such an amazing amount. It's more amazing than if they say, 10 years out of Harvard Business School today, the average student is making 25 million. Wow. Because there's more pe- people making 25 million out of Harvard Business School 10 years out than there were people making 25,000. So at that juncture, my brother said, that's what he's going to do. He's going to go to Harvard Business School. And he starts studying harder and harder than ever. And then they, when he graduated, he applied to the Harvard Business School. They rejected him. Uh. So he went to Columbia and got an, a master's in economics, and then he applied again, and they took him in. And then I was uh, finishing uh, Brooklyn College. I was working very hard because once I found out that uh, I, if I get A's, I, there's a chance I could get into Harvard Business School. I worked. I had three three little girls. And, and Esty is one of them here. <laughs> and I locked them out of my room. I sat at a desk with nothing, no, no dis, uh, distraction. Distraction. Except three little girls, of course. No, but but I locked you all out. Oh. <laughs> and a, just a wall in my in front of me, and I just read the the textbook for the course from cover to cover, over and over and over again. And I read the notes that the teacher, the professor gave us over and over and over again. And then when I came for an exam, even though I read, read very slowly, I got through the exam pretty fair, quickly because I regurgitated everything that I, that I studied over and over again. A Jewish cup. So, but you, did, you had no other company? What about the little pets that were with you in the apartment? <laughs> Don't talk about that. We were so poor. We were so poor. You were smaller than the than the the, the cats we brought the rats, in to, the cats, to, the to fight the rats and the rats I used the rats I used to bang my <laughs> foot to think I'd scare them off. Yeah, and and they just looked at me like we well, 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 you know they didn't run away and and when we got cats in to to chase them away, the cats even ran away. They were so big these rats and roaches and it was it was terrible. We were paying like eighteen dollars a month for rent. In, in the Lower East Side. So it was a tough life. My wife uh, took a job selling at a, at a showroom. Uh, she had a very ex- bad experience because one s- Sunday, I think, she went to a showroom and was bringing a, a bunch of handbags. And as she opened the door, she tripped and went flying in, and, <laughs> and all the handbags flew all over the place. She was so embarrassed, she turned so red. But they were so nice to her because they felt bad for her. But anyway, it was always an adventure. So you got into Harvard, I guess. What happened? Did you make it to Harvard? Yeah, I not only I made, know, I, I not, I not only made it to Harvard. When I got out of Brooklyn College, they released a, a PR piece because I had three kids and it took me eight years to get out, and I was a ma- summa cum laude, a magna cum laude. I forget which. Phi Beta Kappa, so they gave it to all the newspapers. And you have pictures. All of my three little girls were on the front page of the Staten Island Advance, which is where we lived. It was the biggest newspaper in Staten Island. And at that time, New York had about 15 different papers. We were in the Daily News, the Daily Mirror, the Post, the PM. I don't even know. The Herald Tribune. It was Tribune. a human interest story? Herald, Why? Why was it such yeah. a human interest story? Well, because it took me eight years <laughs> to get out, and I, and I had three kids, and I was, you know, I, because I studied so hard and strived so hard, much strived so much, 
That was a great human interest story for Brooklyn and got College. got to the top of the class that because of your hard yeah, work. Right, that didn't do it Despite for me. it all, well. But I was still very poor, and I got in at uh, Harvard Business School. I took all the uh, preparatory exams, and I did well. And then uh, the only thing I had a hard tr- problem with is they asked, you f- they asked on the uh, application, what are your major uh, assets? And that I had no problem putting down because I even exaggerated and, uh, and gave them a bunch of great assets. But then they said, what's your, li- li- your, your, your greatest liability? And I didn't want to put anything negative because I think they might kick me out of it before I get in. So I, I thought about it and talked to different people, bright people and so forth. And finally I wrote, I never give up. I just stick to something that uh, that I'm so determined I never give up. And that uh, that quote appeared in a number of magazines wow. afterwards in the Harvard Review. It was like a great insight. But anyway, I got in and... I think that line alone, if anyone's listening, just learning that and seeing it, not just saying it, but living it, is so inspiring and it's the life lesson. Not only that, it's it's a, I put it in as a liability, but a lot of people say that's that's like uh, Thomas Edison said. You know, somebody walked up to him and said, "How come?" I might have said told us a week or two ago. Somebody walked in, um, a gentleman walked up to Thomas Edison and said, "How come you never gave up? You failed a thousand times before you were successful. How come you never gave up?" So Thomas Edison said, "Who told you?" I failed a thousand times. So he says, everybody knows. It's common knowledge. He says to the gentleman, he says, I never failed once. A thousand times I succeeded in finding out what didn't work. And then I got to to the electric light bulb that worked. So that's that's the right approach. Don't give up. Anyway, I'll I'll deal with again, deal with it this subject again next week because I got a lot more to tell you. I hardly got into it. But well, one, job, one, one, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Greg. I love that I found that I'm on a cover girl. I was in newspapers before I could even walk. Wow. <laughs> and then uh, what, yeah. what was I going to tell you? Uh, well, let me I, ask I you. Want, no, I want every, all, all the mothers and fathers to give their kids confidence that's crucial and to tell them never get discouraged so discouraged that you give up you might change your original plan but only if it's if there's a good reason because it takes a long time to be successful and and those that are successful instantly uh, people that win uh, lotteries or big prizes or something a lot of money or inherited money they inevitably i think in 90 percent of the cases it's it's been determined that they quickly blow all their money or, or get ripped off by you know when when somebody finds out you won a lottery they all come running to you so Goldman Sachs comes and Merrill Lynch comes and they say we can make five six percent a year for you you'll be able to retire and then there's some phony comes and says yeah that, that's Wall Street ripping you off five six percent. I'll make it 25% a year. I'll make it 35 And so, obviously, with no knowledge, you know, a lot of basketball players in the past gave all their money to these kind of guys. So give them encouragement. And, and also, for yourselves, even if you're grown up, be, be like you, you would be to your best friend. Your best friend is, go, is going down or depressed or discouraged. You, you'd give him a pep talk. Give yourself a pep talk. And, and give yourself confidence and, and don't let anything depress you. Wow. Don't, don't, don't get depressed by other people's judgment. Or You just know what you've got to do and do it. Carry out your plan. And I feel I was raised that way. And the positivity and the confidence. And I see the difference when I speak to people and I see they're not so happy and they don't have it, I say, what were your parents like? What was your background? Uh-huh. And not poor, not rich, not this, but having parents who imbue confidence, having that sense of don't give up 
not as a liability, but as an asset. And if and all else fails, then read the book, this, Happiness Guaranteed. This is, this is the last book I wrote, ha- Happiness Guaranteed. Or your, or your misery back. <laughs> Wait, I want to. That's not the last that, book. That's the most recent book. My father is still writing and writing. So get it on ha- happiness guaranteed or your misery back. I've written three books and I'm working on the fourth now. Right. So thank you for tuning in. Join us next week. Join me and whoever my guest is at the time. Thank you, Esty, for being involved and. and so proud and time. thank you for everything you've given to us and to the world and to America and to the Jewish world and to all your the recipients of your wisdom and your caring and your confidence and whatever I gave you, I got much bigger dividends back. I got more nachas and pride and joy from my children than I ever got even from the best deal I ever did. God bless you all. Have a nice week. I love you. Bye. Bye.